Good evening. Welcome to the Finance and Operations and Education and Pupil Services Committee meetings for March 26, 2020. Before we begin, we'll do something fun. We'll, we'd like to wish a very special happy birthday to our Vice President, Ms. Rachel Mitchell. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. During this unprecedented time, while schools are closed and social distancing requirements are in place, the Upper Darby School District needs to continue certain aspects of its business, which includes decisions concerning pandemic planning. For this reason, Upper Darby School District will continue regularly scheduled school board meetings while Governor Wolf's emergency declaration is in place. It is the plan of the school board to hold these meetings with the minimum required departures from normal operating procedures. The Upper Darby School District School Board COVID-19 Special Operating Procedures document outlines expected departures from these, from those normal operating procedures and the policy justification for such departures. At the start of each board meeting held during the emergency declaration, the board will review, will review the departures from normal operating procedures as well as their justifications. While schools are closed and social distancing requirements are in place, the Upper Darby School District School Board finds it necessary to hold virtual school board and school board committee meetings to complete required business. These virtual meetings will allow the public allow for public viewing and participation. Following practices already in place for regular meetings, all virtual school board meetings, in addition to allowing near real-time public viewing and participation, will be recorded and the recordings made available after the meeting. In order to hold virtual school board meetings, adjustments need to be made following existing board policy. These adjustments have been outlined in the Upper Darby School District School Board COVID-19 Special Operating Procedures. Dr. McGarry. Yes, Board President Brown, thank you very much. As a school district, we have made every effort to continue to hold our uh, meetings uh, with the public as close to what we would normally hold if we were here in person together. As a result, we are providing two opportunities for public participation during our committee meetings this evening. The way to send uh, a question or a comment uh, via email is to committee questions at upperdarbysd.org. Again, committee questions at upperdarbysd.org. Please state your name and address um, and tell us which agenda item you'd like to comment or question. Uh, the, each comment or question will be taken before the board proceeds uh, to the next committee meeting. If you'd like to phone in a message, Please do so at 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Again, 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Your message should include your name, address, and the agenda item you'd like to comment on or ask a question. That voice message will then be directed to our email, committeequestions at upperdarbysd.org, and we'll be sure to address your comment or question in the order that they are received prior to the board moving on to from one committee meeting to another committee meeting. I'll update uh, the public on this throughout the evening, but again, committee questions at upperdarbysd.org or please call in at 610-789-720, extension 2000. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. The meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee will please come to order. Roll call, please, Mr. Rogers. As I call each board member's name, please state that you are present and can hear the proceeding. Dr. Haig? I'm present and I can hear the proceeding. Mr. Desnoyers? I am present and I can hear the proceedings. Mr. War Savage? I am present and can hear the proceeding. Mr. Neal? Uh, this is David Neal. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Ms. Dawes. Present. Mr. Fields. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Ms. Curry. Good evening. I am present and I can hear the proceedings. Ms. Mitchell. Hello, everyone. I am present, and I can hear the proceedings. Mr. Brown. Present. 
Policy 003 allows the board to suspend policies or parts of policies when appropriate. Therefore, due to the current ongoing crisis and the governor's closure order, I make the following motions to suspend language in two of the board's policies until the next regularly scheduled meeting. Policy 006.1, which regulates attendance at meetings via electronic communications, I move to suspend the language requiring board members to be present. Specifically, the language would be, a majority of board members shall be physically present at a board meeting when a board member attends through electronic communications. And policy 006, which governs other requirements of board meetings, I move the suspension of language requiring that those members of the public wishing to participate be present. Specifically, the language in the section titled public, public participation would remove the words that reads present at a board meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Does anyone abstain? Motion carries. Mr. Rogers, please begin with an overview of your agenda items for this evening, sir. Tonight we have five agenda items. The first agenda item is a COVID-19 preparedness update. This is informational. District administration will provide an update on the research that we pr produced surrounding COVID-19 preparedness and also the CDC guidelines associated with it. Number two is an online school tax payment option to require board action. We'll review the potential of allowing online tax payments moving forward. Number three is the administration building relocation, which is also board action. The district administration will discuss all past options that have been considered for the district relocation out of the Aronimic Elementary School and propose the option at hand. Number four is a 2020-2021 budget update. This is informational. The district's administration will provide an update on the budget and any new information that's been provided to us at this time. Number five is policies, which will require board action. There are four policies tonight. 335 family medical leaves, 626 federal fiscal compliance, 810.1 drug and alcohol testing for covered drivers, and 904 public attendance at school events. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Please begin with your first agenda item. So as I previously stated, first up is the COVID-19 preparedness update, and the presentation will be given by Marvin Lee. Thank you, Craig. The outbreak of COVID-19 dramatically complicated how we operate our schools. So the Upper Darby School District simply does not have enough space to maintain social distancing in our schools and on our buses. The business office has been gathering information from multiple sources, test different feasibilities, and even renegotiating vendor contracts to provide safe and healthy school opening. This evening, we will present our findings but please be aware that our fi final plan will change based on the official guidelines from the PA Department of Education when they become available. CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, provides guidelines in maintaining healthy school environment in eight different categories. Our presentation tonight will discuss how we are preparing our schools based on the CDC guidelines. The CDC guidelines were last updated on May 19th last week. Can you go to the next page? Yes. Uh, so if you look at the, the slide on the left-hand side, those are the eight different categories from the CDC. It starts with the cleaning and disinfection. One of the items that became very popular with the COVID-19 is the electrostatic spraying. Our maintenance manager, transportation supervisor, and I had an opportunity to have a live product demo of electrostatic spraying about two weeks ago, and we were impressed and we decided to use the electrostatic spraying in our schools going forward. As you can see in the pictures, electrostatic spraying equipment provides much greater coverage than conventional trigger or pump sprays. In the new school year and in the future years, the electrostatic spraying will be an important part of our cleaning operation. In the next slide, we'll talk about how we will apply electrostatic spraying in our schools. So how are we gonna do it? Next page, please. So we already changed the cleaning contract to make sure that we can apply electrostatic spraying. 
in the new school year and beyond, the cleaning contractors will electrostatic spraying all spaces on a daily basis during the flu season and when we ask them to provide additional services. So between December and February, we will disinfect all spaces with electrostatic spraying. And when we find a student who had a cold or flu, we will go ahead and ask the companies to provide additional electrostatic spraying. School district will provide equipment and chemical supplies. The equipment and supplies are quite costly, but the cost of the unit and supplies will be funded through the FEMA, federal FEMA grant. If you look at the chart on the right-hand side, the new contract with the new responsibilities are starting at 10 schools from Aronimink to Beverly Hills. The contracts with the four schools are not ending until next year, but our procurement office negotiated the term without any additional cost. I just wanted to thank Joe from our procurement office for making it happen. And I also would like to thank our contractors for agreeing with the terms at no additional cost. Just for your information, so we were approached by a private company and that provides electrostatic spraying services. And their quote was 4.5 cents per square foot, which is approximately $67,000 each time that we treat the entire school district. But in the new contract, we will be able to do from December through February at no additional cost. And to me, it was a big deal. And we will also make sure that we purchase the items, uh, the units that are approved by the EPA to kill the virus. Next page, please. The cleaning and disinfection of our school buses. Before the school closure in mid-March, our bus drivers were disinfecting our buses with wipes, and we plan to do the same practice when the schools open up. We would love to apply electrostatic spraying in our buses, but will not be uh, practical until we have a battery operated units available in the market. Our electrostatic sprays are pretty heavy. They're about 50 pounds. And in the new school year, our school bus drivers and attendants will wear masks and gloves. And depending on the CDC and PD guidelines, transportation may send letters to families to ensure students wear masks before they get on the bus. It is also important to maintain social distancing when they are waiting for the bus at the bus stops. We also plan to have hand sanitizers and disposable masks available for students on the bus. Uh, next item is the new cleaning chemicals. The business office is also working on introducing new chemicals, lines, and soap dispensers for all our schools. I am especially excited about the new hand soap dispenser because the new unit is designed to minimize the contamination of the soap itself. It's a cartridge-based product, not a pour-in product. It will be hospital-grade antibacterial hand soap in all our schools, and a comprehensive training will be given to facilities employees and cleaning contractors. Next page, please. Not sharing object is a common sense initiative, but still an important point. So we should discourage our students to sharing items with other students. We should also keep our students' belongings from uh, separated from each other. Partnership among parents, teachers, and principal will be an important uh, part to enforce the rule. Ventilation. The CDC recommends that we bring in more outside airs into our buildings. Fortunately, Upper Darby School District has a central control system to control all air handling units. All the dampers are usually open at about 10%, but we can certainly centrally adjust the dampers to bring more outside air into our buildings. Water system, another common sense item. We'd like to get the message out to parents and the schools to minimize use and touching of water fountains and potentially ask students to bring in their own bottles, water bottles. Modify layouts. In the modify layout section, we'll discuss how we will maintain social distancing in our classroom and in our buses. If you look at the diagram, each student will have a personal space of approximately 36 square feet. That's six feet by six feet. Uh, for our calculation, we also assume 20, 250 square feet for each teacher. Next page, please. So we actually went into the classrooms to see how social distancing will impact the classroom layouts. Normally, uh, room 103 in the Ronamink can hold 18 seats, but with social distancing of six feet, we can only place nine seats in that same classroom. So we'd like to look at how 
it's going to impact the entire school district. Next page, please. So if you look at the chart, you see the school name, the current number of students, the new number of students with the social distancing and the capacity. For example, Charles Kelly has 355 students, but if you lay out the classroom is six feet apart, we can only hold 107 students, which is 30% of the original capacity. Another example, Upper Dhabi High School. We have 3,829 students with the new social distancing measures. We can only hold 1,267 students, which is about 33% of the original capacity. School district-wide, we have 12,378 students in May of 2020, but with social distancing, we can only hold 4,719 students at the same time. That is 38% capacity. These figures will force conversations around virtual school, alternating attendances, AM and PM options, and etc. One more important note, special education spaces will likely require more spaces, which will likely reduce the capacity even more. How about the school buses? Next page. To maintain social distancing for on our buses, we will have to assign one student in every two benches to create safe distance between students. If you look at the numbers in red, the distance between the student in front and the two seats back is only 4.7 feet, but we hope we can work out work with this layout because our buses have a high seat, which creates barriers. What does it mean to the entire school district? Next page, please. So our transportation department reviewed each school bus route in vehicle capacity and the student ridership. There are 71 buses that are serving Upper Dhabi schools, not counting charters and non pub schools. If we plan to transport 100% of the normal ridership to all schools, which is approximately 4,800 students, we will require additional 208 buses. But it gets very complicated. First of all, we don't have enough time. It requires at least six months to order and receive the buses. And it comes with a huge price tag of $20 million. And also we have no space to park. We have no drivers. And also we have no use of those buses after the pandemic is over. Even if we transport all those students, we do not have space in our schools to educate them while maintaining social distance. Next page, please. Physical barriers in communal spaces, another common sense item, but another important point. We would like to have physical barriers when it's difficult to maintain six feet apart, such as recession desk. We may provide physical guides to create one-way route in the hallways in the schools, and we encourage staggered use of uh, common spaces, such as playground. Next page, please. Final guidelines to food services. CDC recommends three things in food services, pre-packaged meals, consumption in classroom, and using disposable items. Sounds very simple, but it is complicated if your job is to feed thousands of students at the same time. So we're still gathering information from different sources and testing feasibilities of different options. We're looking forward to receiving additional guidelines from the PA Department of Education, maybe PDE, will mandate students to wear a mask. We don't know. Maybe PDE will mandate thermal camera in each school to check each student's temperatures. We don't know. We're working with a lot of uncertainties, but we'll make sure to quickly adapt to new guidelines when they become available. Thank you for your time, and at this time, I'll take your questions. Mr. Lee, this is uh, Ed Brown. I just have a quick question. I think I know the answer, but I just want to confirm it. Uh, the required number of buses, buses uh, based on social distancing, you had 249, but that's based on if we, if 100% of the kids came to school that currently uses the 71 buses, is that correct? That doesn't take into consideration if we do a staggered schedule where we would need less additional buses, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the board? This is Dr. Heck. So um, my question, and so I also wanted to ask about what Ed was asking about. Do, do we have any preliminary numbers on um, how many buses we would need 
with social distancing if we were operating at closer to that 38% capacity that we talked about um, for, for, for social distancing, distancing within the classroom? We don't have those numbers yet, but that's something that we have to work on to get. And sure. doc, Dr. Haig, I also just want to add to that, because Marvin and I have talked about this at, at nauseum, it feels. What becomes even more complicated is not knowing the constraints we're working with. So without knowing how we're going to fit 38% of student population in each building, it's hard to design transportation routes surrounding that. So the constraints intertwine with each other. But if you did it strictly off transportation, you could really create somewhat of an inequity across the district in the sense that we have two schools, two elementary schools, one outside of the community, who 100% of the students are transported by our buses. So if I say we can only fit 13 students on each bus and I'm going to that school, it's a lot different than a school that has a, a better or a higher rate of walkers or uh, you know, parents driving them to school because you'd have to allocate the entire population of that school on the lesser number of buses. So the inequity between, in, from that perspective from the two, those two buildings versus the other entry schools create a very complicated task to come up with how many, how many students can we bus with our current fleet in total versus just two specific schools. So we are working through that. Uh, and I think as we get more guidance and find out what our options really are going to be come the fall, you know, we'll be able to pull out that information. Just a related question based on Dr. Haig's comment. Um, if you, let, let's just assume you work it out, you know, as far as the number of kids going to each school and taking the buses based on social distancing to 38%. Um, and let's say the number goes from 249 to, I don't know, 50. Is, is there um, a use for those buses or would, would, would one bus be beyond 71 be a waste and we wouldn't know what to do with it? Or is there a certain threshold where we could say we could use those additional 40 for some other reason or uh, would we not be able to utilize any of the additional buses? So I think that, and we've talked about this in the past, and just like we have an issue with space to educate students, regardless of COVID-19, we have a space issue. Along with that, we also have a space issue at our transportation center, which you'll see in a later presentation of, of how that lays out. Currently, we, have, we can't even fit our drivers' personal vehicles on site because there are so many buses there that we're out of parking. We have, we have employees parking in surrounding neighborhoods just to get to work. And even if you could buy the buses and you could physically afford it, there's no space. So, you know, even if you're talking about adding 10 buses, there's not enough room on site to be able to park those. So we could get creative, but there, you can see the price tag of $95,000 per bus. To be able to buy something is almost as if it's a disposable item. When this ends, you will not have the need for the bus. And you could, you could build in like, going through our fleet, the older ones, you could retire at that point and still have the new bus, but it's, it would still create some complications. Understood. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I wanted to, this is Dr. Hegg again. Um, I wanted to ask about this. So um, I heard um, Mr. Lee say that we're getting antibacterial soap, hospital grade antibacterial soap, but as I understand that the antibacterial soap is not more effective. It's certainly not effective against a virus, which is, you know, of course, not a bacteria. Um, and there are a lot of problems with antibacterial soap, including that they may lead to antibiotic-resistant bacteria, that they create environmental problems, that they maybe have endocrine disruptors. Um, is there a particular reason that we think it's important to use antibacterial soap? Because my understanding is, is really that the FDA and other groups have sort of backed down on that and said we, we really should go back to using plain soap because antibacterial soap is not better. Dr. Heck, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you on that because um, I don't have enough knowledge about the soap to give you intelligent answer, unfortunately. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get back to you on that. Fair, fair enough. I just want to put that out there that my understanding is it's not better and there are many, many ways in which it's, it's worse or potentially worse. So maybe we can reconsider that part. Thank you. Gotcha. Uh, thank you, Marvin, for putting this together. Um, the buses 
said they they are uh, disinfected uh, daily, and I was wondering, are they actually disinfected um, between the rounds or just after the school day? They're doing it between the rounds. So after the morning round, they're disinfecting the buses. But like in between like the high school and the elementary route or just after the morning and then after the afternoon? After the morning run. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Good evening. Um, I just have a question um, regarding the soap. I know that the soap dispensers, I wasn't able to see the soap dispenser on the screen. I don't know if it was shown, but I just wanted to know what the plan was to make sure that the soap is um, fully, um, you know, replenished. I know sometimes there's been issues in, you know, with soap replenishment. So I just want to make sure because we can't have any, you know, mishaps with, with soap not being replenished. And, you know, just the fact that um, that needs to be a regular practice. I know Dr. Hegg talked about the antibacterial um, but I also know that there are some allergies to antibacterial soaps as well. So um, I wanted to ask that. And I also wanted to find out um, about the, the feeding, Marvin. I know that you shared that there is a plan about, you know, how the feeding will happen. Is it going to be allowed for children to bring in their own lunches, um, or is it just going to be um, feeding through the lunch program? Thank you. So the First question about the soap dispensers. So the procurement office, facilities management, the business office, we are going through a very comprehensive process to replace the soap dispensers in the entire school district so we can provide the best product and we can also standardize all the units in the entire school district. One of the things that we are also doing is that we are making the ordering process much simpler for our custodians. In the past, there was like a paper process that we have to go through. However, our custodians will be able to order those much, much simpler, almost like an Amazon.com type of transactions. So we expect the fill rate of the soap and the soap dispenser will be much, much better in the future future years. Uh, CDC does recommend like bringing their own lunch, but I didn't mention that because we are 100% uh, the meal provided the school district. So... Yeah, okay, so the CDC does mention that. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Thank you. Yep. Just a couple of reminders to those viewing in the public. Um, on the board docs, this presentation on the right-hand side says this is a, I guess, a draft plan. It's not the actual plan for the school district. So I just want to pause to those that are viewing in their homes or somewhere else watching this presentation uh, virtually this evening. What we are attempting to do here, and I want to say to Marvin and to Craig Rogers, I appreciate the effort. A lot of time went into this. Um, we are, I tasked Marvin, uh, Craig, uh, Joe McGilvery, and, and their team to come back to me with at least a first look at what we, what we have to consider if we were to do some kind of a hybrid learning opportunity where some students can at least come into the building if we're practicing social distance. At this time, even if we are to go green, even if the county goes green, the school district will still be forced to practice some type of social distancing plan when schools resume. So I do want to be clear that this is a first step, and I believe to Mr. Brown's question earlier, Board President Brown's question about the buses, um, yes, obviously it's a good question. Would there be a break-even point? And I think Craig was answering that, you know, obviously we'd have to consider what we could replenish. Um, the reality for us will be what can we afford to do without as we go to balance this budget? So $95,000 for a bus is more than we pay most teachers in the school district. I think Mr. Brown was pointing that out that what is the break-even point just to get through this window of time is an expense. Um, not to mention that our priority right now is that, as we pointed out in this presentation, is to improve our virtual learning opportunity plan that we put into place, the educational opportunities plan that we put in place uh, quickly this school year. So right now, our number one priority is to improve the online instruction we're providing if we're to be in that environment next year. Regardless, even if we're green, According to the latest update from PDE and from C the CDC, we still will have to have some kind of social distancing plan up and ready, even if we're green as a school district or as a county. With that said, we still will have to have a robust virtual online learning platform. So we are working 
uh, and thankfully the board and the public allowed us to change our calendar, we are providing professional development to our teachers to make sure we have a better online learning uh, opportunity as we go in the next school year, regardless of being in person. This plan, however, is the first step to allow us to look at, if you go back to one of the screens that shows the, the, the different schools, uh, Craig, so one example would be on a kindergarten, now we know that practicing you know, six feet of social distancing in a classroom and how many kids we can get on a bus, we can now begin to plan how many days of the week can we rotate through bringing st students in, days of the week. We're also gonna look at, okay, kindergarten might come in obviously different than first through fifth grade, but first through fifth grade at Westbrook Park, we may rotate on a Monday and Tuesday to try to equal this out so that every elementary school student, because that will be our priority, on an hourly or every two hours rotating kids and bringing them in so that our students are coming in staggered throughout the week, one day with catching up on schoolwork and providing training to our staff, the rest of the week staggering either every two hours or hour, students coming in and being live in person, and then rotating that out over the 180-day school year next year. Uh, that would be the consideration. What we had to first do is look at, okay, what does social distancing look on the bus? What does social distancing look in the classroom? And how many kids can we fit in on a time? We're going to take this data and come back and provide an even more option. One of the things I'm going to consider doing with uh, board president and the board's uh, opportunity, in a non-board meeting, committee meeting, do a community forum, a virtual community forum, and kick around a couple different options and see what the public feels like as we get to next school year works best. Obviously, it won't be easy for everyone, but our game plan just after tonight's presentation is to focus kindergarten, maybe up until sixth grade, trying to bring our younger students in more so than not based on the data that we have right in here as a first look. So this is, a, this is not the final plan. This is the first step of many steps to try to get this right if we're able to bring students and staff in person. The next thing we're working on is how many of our students and parents will feel comfortable returning to in-person instruction. We're probably gonna put a survey out in the next month or so, and then trying to find out from our staff how much of our staff feels comfortable coming back in person. So there's a couple more steps of data collection that we're gonna have before we finalize this. But I do wanna make it clear to the public, this is just a draft and not a final plan. It's just consideration of what we're looking at to try to pull this off next school year. Even if we're green, even if the county moves to green, we're still gonna to have to practice some social distancing and provide a flexible hybrid virtual learning opportunity for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. Were there any other comments or questions from the board? Leah. Leah. Good evening. Um, Marvin, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I know it's at the top of most parents' concerns about addressing the upcoming school year. Very thorough plan, and I appreciate even the, um, the guidance letting us know that this is based on CDC recommendations and what this looks like from a financial impact to our school district. So as Dr. McGarry talks about the next phase of the plan, my question is how do we look at areas where kids can't isolate or areas that would probably need to be cleaned on a more frequent basis, not maybe just once a day, like locker rooms and bathroom facilities? How do we have physical education or sports? And also, um, my final concern is, or opportunity, can we look at contracting um, transportation? Um, I know there's a lot of transportation opportunities that are provided through aftercare, things like that. I'm sure that'll be in the up and coming revision of this plan, but just wanting to put out there some of the parental concerns around physical education and sports shared locker room spaces and cleaning of that and trying to avoid sharing equipment. So we talked about that in a classroom, but what does that look like when we're talking about a basketball, a baseball, things of that sort? So thank you. Awesome questions. And I, I think um, physical education in the building, we're going to have to do that based on the social distance and provide cleaning uh, and training to the health and physical education teachers to pull that off. 
From a PIAA standpoint, every time we get an update from the PIAA, we post it on the website. We are still looking for guidance as far as sports are concerned. Um, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on where you live, that's opening up in areas diff at different times. So um, as we are probably opening up later than some counties, Leah, one of the things Ms. Dawes will do is we'll look at how other, how other um, states and other um, counties are handling those, those very topics. I know there's a task force and we're, we're looking to get information locally from the county as well as from the state. We have yet to hear that information from the state. Hopefully they'll provide us guidance. An important uh, point, I know I provided this to the board and I know um, many of the board members are aware of this and the public may not be. I know our, um, our music program is. One of the key areas uh, to consider is our choral programs. That one of the issues that's come out is that the um, large number of students singing together and performing together is really not allowable under the current CDC guidelines, even if students were to wear a mask. So there's a, a couple different things that we're trying to navigate, sports and as well as the arts. And as we provide, if we get more information closer to that, we'll obviously provide that update and take that in consideration. But very good point related to locker rooms, sports and music, how we can do that. Um, as far as uh, interscholastic sports are concerned, there is a task force and our very own former um, uh, 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 athletic director, Mrs. Holly Farnese, sorry Holly if you're watching, is actually on the state task force. So she'll provide us some inside information um, I've talked to her recently about what, what's coming out of that. So we'll get some good feedback from her directly uh, as a member of that task force. So good questions. Thank you. Um, I, did, I just did want to say I'm thrilled that even though there's some, a little bit of a silver lining, the regular cleaning during the flu season that will come out of this is definitely an upgrade. So thank you for, for looking at that and being able to work that into the plans. Um, I guess one question I had is, Dr. McGarry, you had said that um, you were considering a survey to parents. In that survey, um, will, it, will there be a question something like, are, will you be choosing the Upper Darby Cyber Academy for the next school year? Um, you know, just because I know that's an option. And I, I know that, um, you know, we only have a certain amount of licenses purchased for that what does that look like if we were to have an increase in enrollment in that area? I would not be recommending the Cyber Academy. I would, I would be recommending the Upper Darby School District's regular uh, learning uh, platform. So one of the key parts to this is, and okay. I, I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Ms. Mitchell, is we want to move away from the purchasing of the, some of the platform that we have with the Cyber Academy. And from this point until at least June 10th, we're going to get that much closer to having our own courses and our own teachers designing the instruction that's going to be there so that we can move away from having to pur purchase these licenses that exist in our cyber academy. Over time, our goal will be to have um, our own school district curriculum and lessons and instruction taking place in the cyber academy. That way, we'll have this ability to have flexible instruction happening with our own courses. So as we roll in the next school year, that's why I want to gather this information. We'll be able to say, as we schedule the school, that these are the lessons that are provided through Schoology and teachers will know that they have to develop those lessons virtually as well as provide some instruction in person. Um, so we're going to navigate so, that based on that data. So even if school, if school were to go back in session regularly, if they relax all of the guidelines and were able, and, but parents still chose to educate at home, are you saying the teachers in the regular classroom setting would be also putting those lessons on Schoology and maybe going live and things like that throughout the day? Is that because I, I do think there's going to be a subset of parents that choose to stay home? Yes, and we'll cross that bridge when we when we see what the actual number will be because I think there's going to be a lot of students that do want to come in and sometimes uh, child pressure versus adult pressure child pressure wins. I hope. Um, but I do, okay. I, I well, do we'll know see. that we're navigating the reality that things are going to be different and, and the different will be that we're going to have classes that are in person and classes that are blended and classes that are virtual and that our teachers in this school district will be, will be providing those lessons and that, and that game plan. That's why we closed early to develop that and get to a more robust um, virtual instruction instead of logging in and just completing assignments. Great. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, I just, I just was trying to maybe clarify what um, Mrs. Mitchell was saying, or maybe not clarify. I just wondered if 
maybe her point was that if a parent is going to choose cyber school, we're, we'd certainly hope that they would pick ours as opposed to other alternatives. Thank you. If there is no other comments or questions from the board, Mr. Rogers, please feel free to go into agenda item number two. Thank you, Mr. Lee. The next agenda item is the online school tax payment options, which again will require board action. We are going to have Marvin Lee present this as well. So go ahead, Marvin. Thank you. This one is a kind of short one. Uh, the business office has been working with our tax processing company and our bank to make sure the online portal payment portal is available to our taxpayers. Today, we will provide updates on our progress. Quick overview of the payment online payment program. So there are approximately 29,000 property owners that pay school taxes, and the mailing the payments to the lockbox used to be the only option for the taxpayers. However, with a new online payment program, our taxpayers will be able to submit payments online and also through phone. If the taxpayer chooses to choose to uh, make payments online, the system will authenticate the taxpayer. The taxpayer will create online account and make payments. Then the taxpayer will be able to get the receipt right away. Through the system, the taxpayer can also see the account status and the payment history. The financial impact of this program to the Upper Dhabi School District and the taxpayers. If the taxpayer makes the payment through credit card, either through online or phone, the taxpayer will be charged 2.6% fees. However, there's no payment required from the Upper Dhabi School District. If the taxpayer makes payment through electronic check, uh, through bank routing number and the bank account number, there is no charge to the taxpayer, but the, tax, uh, the, but the school district will pay 30 cents per transaction. That's actually a saving for the Abu Dhabi school district because if the taxpayer sends the check to the lockbox, the school district used to pay 40 cents. So if the, the taxpayer chooses this option, we will save 10 cents per transaction. There's also a $2,500 one-time set of fee that school district has to pay. Implementation timeline. Here's our timeline. The most critical step of the whole process was to make sure the tax file on our end work with the Wells Fargo system. And we are happy to announce that the file compatibility was checked out okay. And once the board approves, we will go ahead and sign up the underwriting process and also building the online portal. Our solicitor already reviewed the legal document required for the underwriting process, so we are good to go there. So we expect the testing to be done by June 22nd. We expect the system to be launched by June 29th. Finally, on July 1st, our tax office will send tax bills with the information about the electronic payments to all taxpayers on July 1st. Finally, here is how we will be communicating and supporting our taxpayers. First of all, when we send out the tax bills, uh, there will be information about different options, online payment and phone payment. And second, Maureen from our tax office reached out to Upper Dhabi Public Library System to get access to our taxpayers and also create a hyperlink in the Upper Dhabi, I mean the library system computers. So there are three locations, public library locations in Upper Dhabi, and um, the township was more than happy to work with us to make the computers available to our taxpayers. Uh, after that, we will create one page document to provide payment options, important dates, contact information, maybe FAQ, and that one page summary will be available in our website. Lastly, our business office will have trained employees to support the taxpayers with any issues. So that's the end of the presentation, but what I wanted to mention one more thing. Uh, Ms. Maureen Williams from our tax office has been heading this project and she deserves a lot of credit to making sure that we are making progress as planned. Thank you, Ms. Williams, and thank you for your time, and this concludes our presentation about the online tax payment. Hello, this is Mr. Desnoyers. Okay. Um, my question is about the um, online payment option. If a, if a taxpayer um, decides to pay using the online system, will they be able to set up a payment plan um, meaning an installment payment plan, I guess I'll say, uh, or is the online option um, 
and for that matter, the uh, the phone option, just a one-time payment. Thank you. So, Mr. Desnoyers, the payment options will still follow the guidelines of all of our typical bills. This is only giving the taxpayer another medium to make payment versus strictly having to send a check or money order through our lockbox. So, it'll it, you could pay in installments like you normally could in the three installments should you pay your first installment before the deadline, uh, but it's not going to create any new installment uh, features, really. For We're going to follow our normal tax billing cycle. Uh, okay, so so if I, I wanted to split my tax payment over s several payments, I, could I could I log in online and pay, say, a third of it, then the next month log in online, pay another third, and then the next month you log in. I'd have to log in, you know, three at one time for each, you know, portion of the payment I wanted to make. Is that correct? That's correct. But remember, it's you wouldn't be able to dictate the price. You right. would have to pay what the installment's calculated at. So, like, if somebody wanted to come in and pay half and then pay a quarter later and a quarter after that, that's not how it works. It's, a, it's three equal installments. Uh, following our deadlines. So if you miss the deadline okay. for the first installment, you no longer are able to pay those installments. You have to pay the flat or penalty if you miss the flat window. Uh, okay. Thank you. But And just to add to this, because I don't think Marvin uh, touched on it, the way that the system works is, and when he talked about he quickly touched on building out the website, what would happen is you would go in and either put your folio number or your bill number in and verify your property. And your tax bill would essentially pull up on the on the website. Uh, and what's great about that is to not allow people to pay the wrong amounts. Because what happens right now, uh, and it takes a lot of time, and back to Marvin's previous point, a lot of Maureen Williams' time. So, again, thank you to Maureen. But what happens is we'll have people send checks to our lockbox, and if it doesn't match exactly, the lockbox forwards them back to us. So during high tax season... You know, July through October, really, um, we get buckets of mail of people who are sending the wrong check amounts. We then have to manually go through those, find out what the issue was, why they were rejected from the lockbox, and resolve them, whether that be mailing it back with a letter to the taxpayer or potentially they put the wrong uh, folio number and we can research all those topics and be able to get them paid. By creating this online payment, the taxpayer is able to verify their information on their own prior to making the payment. It'll, it'll pop up in front of them. Thank you for that information. Um, my first question is the 2.6% fee charged to the taxpayer. Um, is this the fee that the uh, credit card agency is, is charging, and is that a... Um, the fee, like, there's no uh, icing on the cake for them. There's, like, we're not profiting off of that. No, this is it's strictly a pass-through fee, so the district is not incurring any additional costs for the added service. So, as okay. you said, it's a credit card processing fee that is directly associated with the taxpayer's payment option. Okay. And uh, my second question is regarding uh, mortgage companies. So, I don't pay the the bill directly myself, my uh, mortgage company does. Um, it, th does the school district work with larger mortgage companies? For instance, mine is through Wells Fargo, and I know our account's at Wells Fargo, um, to possibly switch them over to the electronic check, because like Marvin uh, said earlier, it did save us uh, 10 cents, and you know, dimes add up. Um, is that a possibility that we can work with the larger mortgage companies to transition them to a cheaper option for us? So the, there are currently and has been for quite some time uh, certain banks or mortgage companies who pay directly. Wells Fargo is actually one of them, and it comes through as one payment, David. So we get one big check with a report that breaks down each tax payment, So and that's actually automatically uploaded into our uh, e-tax track system. So you're not, your savings would be 10 cents on, on that one check uh, because it's one check for thousands of properties. And there's 
only we only in a given year get three mortgage we call them mortgage tape payments because they come through as if it's a you know you ran a tape and you have each property on there uh, there's three main three or four main companies uh, but Wells Fargo does their own some of the smaller mortgage companies go through a company called uh, Loretta uh, and there's two other ones I'm, and the names are escaping me but you know they all come through as batch payments together but so that's a great question but you know right now they are using their economies of scale to, to be as efficient as possible. Okay, so currently this is really going to just impact in, individuals that are paying uh, their tax bills um, individually. That's, that's correct. So if you do not okay. have an escrow uh, account set up through your mortgage company and you're paying out of your personal bank account, this is the uh, taxpayer that we're addressing here. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's no other questions or comments from board members, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, for answering the questions, and thank you, uh, Ms. Williams, for your hard work as well. Next agenda item, please. So agenda item number three is the administ administration building relocation, which will require board action. I'm going to hand this presentation over to our assistant facility supervisor, Craig Harnachek. Good evening. Um, as you're aware, the district has been looking for a place to relocate the administrative staff currently housed at the Aronimic property with the upcoming Aronimic project causing there to be displaced shortly in the future. Um, we're looking at a move out date no later than July 30th, 2021. Uh, the district explored uh, several alternatives. Uh, my position here is just to discuss the options in taking the current transportation facility at 8201 North Lansdowne Avenue and converting that into not only a maintenance and bus housing facility, but also the new administration building. We've looked at the property and it's largely underutilized. The entire second floor is over 12,000 square feet and that neatly dovetails with the requirements that we have for our administrative staff. What we could do with a capital investment is bring our administrative staff into the building, bring the functionality level up to the closer to 100%, correct deficiencies that we have to address in the building irregardless of them moving or not. There are two options that we've drawn at this point in time. One option would be if the sanitation department were to leave that site and this is our more favored option, both in a cost and a functionality standpoint. The section op second option would be if the sanitation department opts to stay at their current location and remain housed on the property. If we can just proceed to the first slide. The first slide shows the existing conditions, uh, the bus parking layouts and the shortfalls that the building currently has. As you can see, there's no organized parking for our bus attendants and drivers. There is no handicapped access to the building. There are no handicapped toilet facilities. The access to the second floor is not code compliant. Uh, bus parking is sort of a hodgepodge of areas where they can squeeze in when the buses are off-site and a large unimproved lot towards the back of the property that's currently uh, covered in trees that we're looking to actually remove and extend parking further up. There's currently only one visitor parking space available. There is 75,000 square feet of gravel covering the area that requires paving at this point in time and in the future. And as I said earlier, the building site does require numerous repairs just to keep the building itself intact. And I'm speaking about pointing of walls, replacement of doors, failing windows, sills, uh, degradation of some of the parapet walls. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the site plan without the sanitation department on site. What we have here is 139 parking spaces allocated to all the bus drivers and aides. This would remove the parking burden that we presently face on the neighborhoods, 
adjacent to the property where bus drivers and aides are forced to park due to the current parking restrictions, and then also the shopping centers where they transit back and forth. There are 25 visitor parking spaces located at the front of the property with three handicapped spaces added. During the board meetings, when we exceed that capacity, they would obviously be in the evening where bus uh, transiting wouldn't be taking place. So we'd also have that additional 139 spaces of bus and aid parking available for that use. The bus parking is organized for the maximum level of efficiency for moving buses on and off the property and getting them out of the rear of the building. The problem is there's choke points that the buses have to pass through, blind turns, things like that, that are always problematic, especially when you're dealing with a vehicle that's over 40 feet in length. The transportation traffic would then also be relegated to one side of the building. Currently, we have both staff, transportation, and sanitation all using the same driveway, all basically at the same time, which is obviously problematic. And then you can see the ball field up to the top right-hand side. That would be preserved. We would leave that green space virtually untouched moving forward because with the vacation, vacating of sanitation, we have enough area to house our bus parking. Now, the sanitation department would probably want to be moving in around March of 2020. That would allow us to get in, do our paving work, do our drainage work to accommodate the uh, final renovation for the move-in, uh, the balance of the staff. Next slide, please. This site plan shows the sanitation remaining on site. And as you can see, we've moved into that entire green space, the former ball field, paved that entire lot. And we're still moving through those choke points, as you can see, coming from the one side of the building towards the front. Obviously not the best scenario for us. And then again, we would still have sanitation and transit using the same driveway. Staff would be relegated to the other driveway on the other side of the property. The bus parking is less efficient. As I said, the choke points are problematic. And then also, our site costs would be higher. And then we'd be losing that green space that we currently have. So it is the less desirable of the two options. Next slide, please. These are the floor plans for the first and second floor for the interior of the building. What we're doing moving forward is providing for handicapped access, both parking and in and out of the building, handicapped access to the second floor of the building, dedicated toileting facilities to segregate the public, the staff, and the bus drivers, and then also handicapped capacity for all of those groups. There's secured pathways within the building to limit public access and separate staff that don't require any type of public interface from public areas. We will then have code compliant emergency exits as required from the building. There will be a multi-purpose uh, space for training, board functions, and in-service day functions. There will be a high storage uh, system for our paper filing requirements. There is interior parking to house our maintenance vehicles, which are more or less filled with tools that are subject to vandalism if they're parked outside, even on the lot, even in a secured area. The internal bus traffic is also improved, and we'll be addressing some structural requirements that we can't currently due to buses turning inside the facility. This eliminates the buses having to turn once they enter the parking garage. It'll just be a straight move and in and out. And then we'll also be adding an additional bus service bay for housing buses and providing uh, long-term storage for an additional bus. In addition to that, we'll be addressing the deficiencies in the building, the pointing requirements, roofing requirements, waterproofing, windows, masonry issues, failing doors, and parapet walls. Thank you for your patience, and this time I'll take questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Hornacek. Are there any uh, questions or comments from the board? Hey, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, this is uh, Don Field. The, the first question I have is, has this property ever been looked at before? Like, has any other planning work ever been done on this property to, to see if uh, any development is possible? And then the second question is, uh, how have the conversations with the township been going as far as sanitation moving off the property? I can't speak to any prior discussions that have taken place. Obviously, I'm relatively new in the history of the district, but to my knowledge, no. There has been no planning for an expansion prior to this point, and I'd like to turn it over to Craig Rogers for his discussions with the sanitation department. Yeah, so uh, Craig is right that as far as we know, there has not been any planning, especially for any use other than what it's currently being used as. Uh, until we got to this point, we started uh, really looking at what our alternatives were for district administration, which included looking at many different uh, uh, building lease options, uh, potentially purchasing, looking at, for internal space uh, throughout the district, and that's where we came to this site. Uh, so, you know, that's how we got there. Uh, as far as communication with the township, we've had multiple meetings with them about, about various uh, topics and you know how the district and the township work together as a team uh, they seem to be okay with the idea uh, but you know they are well aware of this presentation and the idea of uh, us taking over that portion of the site and you know we will work hand in hand with them through this process all right th thanks craig i, I just want to say I, I really do appreciate um the work that craig artichek and, and marvin lee have been doing um and what I really like about this administration is the combination of institutional knowledge that some of our longer, longer time members have, as well as the outside perspective that our newer members have. The administration is just, it allows for a lot of good work to get done, and it's much appreciated. Yes, I just, two different things. One, I want to uh, make sure I remind the public how to participate this evening. Um, you can participate by sending an email to committeequestions at upperdarbysd.org. Please provide your name, uh, an address, and which agenda item you'd like to leave a comment or a question that we can address. Or you can certainly phone uh, a question or a comment in, 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Same idea, please your name, address, and the agenda item you'd like to question or leave a comment for so that we can address it this evening. And I just want to quickly say, Don uh, Fields, uh, board, pre our board member Fields, I agree. Uh, Craig and Marvin have been a, a welcome addition to the school district and, and by the way for those joining this tonight looking at this what Craig Harnacek put together these drawings and this idea this concept he, he put together on his own so that's an internal look at it we didn't even have to pay for an architect to look at that yet at this point in time although we have gone on to to bring in costs associated with this so you could turn it over to the next board member I'm not sure um, who could answer this but I, I know as our district grows, and, and I assume we're going to um, increase in enrollment, you know, uh, 10, 20 years from now, um, will this space be sufficient um, for additional staffing needs uh, within uh, the administration? And um, where, where would we, like, see that, see that need? So, David, I think the building portion of the question. We can probably accommodate probably 10 to 15 percent more in the building. Uh, the current layout does not reflect that, but we can build that in. That's not an issue. As to staffing, I have to defer that to someone else. Yeah, and David, when you speak to increased enrollment, the, the people who would be housed in this facility or who are currently housed in the uh, central office at Adironomic. Uh, so, you know, if enrollment went up in that impacted the number of teachers. That's obviously not going to be reflected in this building. Uh, I think that one other thing that Craig had pointed out quickly is the other piece of this is Craig found space on the first floor to be able to actually incorporate a boardroom. So what that does for us is actually gets us off the high school campus. And for anybody watching in the community, they realize when you come to a board meeting when there's a any kind of event, whether it be you know student event, athletic event, parking is at a premium. On this, on this campus. So removing the public venue of a board meeting and being able to put it on an isolated campus where you're not dealing with those same type of interactions uh, is, a, is a major benefit to us. And, and Craig was able to even incorporate 
visitor parking as close to the what would be the front entrance as possible. Uh, so, you know, to Dan's point as well, Craig did a fantastic job with this. Uh, and we have not hired an architect to do a full rendering at this point, but we did bring in a uh, an engineer to do a costing out so, and, so that we would have those numbers available for the cost of the project. Okay, and so some staff members right now, you know, work out in the schools. Um, they spend a lot of their time out with teachers, you know, the coaches. Uh, would they have space available in the administration building for them to, you know, spend a day to work there? You know, would there be um, empty desk, basically, that someone could come into and, and work from? That way we can free rooms up as the, the schools in which they're actually taking up space. So that's a great question. Uh, currently, right now, one of the changes we've made recently to our, administra our current administrative office about two years ago is we actually converted a copy room into a small conference room because space is at a premium all throughout the district. And I will tell you that from the time that we've created that small conference room, it's been utilized in the way that you're stating, where there's teams that come in, the coaches, special ed supervisor, or multiple supervisors go in and use that space very frequently. In Craig's design, he's added multiple small conference rooms that would be able to be utilized in that way. Uh, we can certainly go back and, and, like Craig said, I'm sure there's some space that can be created for an additional office or two uh, to evaluate whether or not that's a direction we want to go in. Okay, yeah, I, I think it's important that we take a look at the schools and see what space is available to, um, that, that's actually currently being used in, in that sort of situation that uh, students uh, can't use, um, you know, because coaches are in there or district staff are in there, like the boardroom um, at the high school where we can actually move that uh, away from the, the schools um, and put them uh, into this administration building. So thank you for that. We currently have several cubicles available, probably somewhere on the order of five to ten that can, they're vacant at this point in time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, Dr. McGarry, you want to add something? Yeah, I just, I just want to say to David Neal's point and Craig Harnacek and uh, Craig Rogers and, and the board members know this is for the public. We're looking at this option because um, there is really no space. And I think David Neal's point is, is well noted. Um, we attempted to lease facilities outside of the district because there wasn't currently space available for us to, to make that happen. Uh, I know Craig uh, Rogers will talk about in the long term how this actually will be more cost effective than leasing the spaces outside of the school district. But I know Craig Harnacek and I, we spent some time looking to, to try to offset to David, uh, board member David Neal's question, how can we free up teaching and learning space and get the curriculum instruction or the administrators in a building to work together, even trying to figure out a way to have central registration, busing, and everything all in one area make use of space. So to uh, Mr. Neal, David Neal's point, we, we've looked at all of those options. Even when, it, when it's all said and done, we still, even after renovating this, will still need space. Um, what we are really trying to address right now is to get out of Aronimic to provide the space for more instructional opportunities at the elementary level. And right here in this room that we're sitting in, when I was a high school student, this was a college and career planning uh, room that will try to free this back up for the high school to be able to use this space instead of it being a boardroom. So we do feel that we're making that, that those examples to try to free up space for educational re me me reasons in the district. And this space would allow us to do that, or at least get closer to that. I just wanted to thank you for um, your creative um, look at this particular building. I know the building needs a lot of work, but also um, to, to Mr. Neal's point, there will be a whole boardroom on the first floor that I'm sure staff could utilize that we're only going to use um, in the evenings twice a month. And I know Dr. McGarry holds some staff meetings and things there. So, um, you know, so there will be that space available. So thank you for this creative look um, in one of our existing facilities and trying to figure out how to better utilize it and, you know, give it a much needed upgrade um, for the conditions that um, we presently have. So thank you. My pleasure. Uh, the boardroom will actually be a multi-purpose room. We're planning on in-service functions, training functions there, just as a boardroom. Uh, it would really be underutilized. So we're looking to really move that much more to the forefront. 
Now, I, I just had a question. Um, it, it, are, are we discussing whether or not the, the, the board of directors uh, prefers to have the sanitation department on the, the, the property or off the property? Are we discussing that now, or is this sort of a, um, just a, a, these are possible options and we'll discuss later? I believe the administrator's recommendation would be to work with the township to have the sanitation removed to keep the open space on the back of the property. I know that in my conversations with the mayor in particular, um, I know that they'd prefer to try to keep the use of the open space in the field. I know that the district, as much of that as we can, um, and I think when with Craig Harnacek's plan that's been outlined, we feel the flow is better if we can work with the township and relocate the sanitation trucks that are there. The development would cut down on our um, blacktopping any more of the area, keep some of the open space that already exists there, and allow us to actually have better flow uh, in and out of the property if we were able to do that. So the recommendation from the administration, Craig and Craig, would be that we would like to work with the township to ask them to uh, take back the sanitation and then go from there. And, and our conversations have been positive and productive. They will need some time, um, but March of 2021, I think, as long as it's not tomorrow or next week, would provide them that opportunity to do so. So, Mr. Neal, to your uh, comment, the administration's recommendation would be to ask and work with the township to remove the sanitation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I, I, I wanted to try to push for to, to keep that green space. And, um, and during your discussions with the township to find out um, any additional or incurred costs um, for uh, trash removal uh, from our, our district buildings. Yes, we're on that as well. I know Craig and I have had those conversations. Over to you. Just to summarize, to um, you know, to Dan's point, talking about uh, the fiscal part of this, uh, we did hire an engineer to go out. The board approved us to have that engineer go out and do a costing study on both models uh, to get an idea of projected costs. The projected cost comes in at between fifteen point nine and sixteen point two million dollars. Uh, so, the comment that Dan had made is. How does that look for the future and as far as making the fiscally responsible decision? So like we previously stated and we have discussed at previous meetings, we've looked at leasing buildings. So if you compare the leasing of a building to relocate central administration versus investing funds into a building that you own, uh, the you know, bond associated with issuing, uh, being able to do these improvements would be paid off over 25 years. You'd have that asset for a very long time. A conservative, useful life of something like that is 40 to 50 years. Uh, and here at Upper Darby, we, we find ways to stretch that well beyond 40 to 50 years. Uh, on the other side of that, if you were to pay a, a lease year after year with a modest like 3% increase uh, to your lease payments year over year, that same amount of money would be spent within those 25 years, depending on the leasing options, square footage of the lease, and at the end of that, you have nothing to show for it. You don't own the building, you've leased it, and eventually have to go somewhere anyway. Unless, as a district, we were committing to permanently leasing a facility for district administration. I would not recommend that because it's an, it's an annual incurred cost in perpetuity. Um, so when you go to look at whether you want to invest those dollars into a property we own versus leasing, you know, we do believe this is the more fiscally responsible option. Um, you know, early on in our plans for improving the facilities and being able to build new schools, uh, we had the idea that 69th Street would be become an elementary school, and we've since learned that that property has, uh, you know, some some issues where we may not be able to build on that property. And what would happen there is you'd have to look at how to adjust with the elementary schools and the buildings we have. So there was an idea at one point that you know, maybe five, seven years from now, we would be able to turn around, renovate the kindergarten center and turn that into an administration building. It looks like now you, we will need that for educational space, uh, potentially as an elementary school or, you know, as we plan to move forward. Uh, but the idea there is even if you were to rent for, say, five to seven years in our original plan, you still would then have to turn around and renovate the kindergarten center, which is set up to be a school, and turn it into a office building essentially. Uh, so there would have been a mass capital improvement cost associated with that as well. So it's somewhat of a shift to another uh, internal site that the district has. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. 
think we've covered everything. All the questions and concerns of board members for that agenda item, please move on to the next one. Thank you. So next up, we have the 2020-2021 budget update, and this is informational. Uh, so we'll jump right into this. I'm actually going to hand it over to Dr. McGarry to kick it off. Um, so the budget process, as we've discussed uh, last month, we will we'll continue to update before the board takes final action, um, and we want to review the timeline again. So in November of 2019, uh, the budget process, we kicked it off publicly with a review of the Act 1 timeline, and we talked about the difference between a preliminary budget versus an accelerated opt-out. At the time, we talked about our base index of 2.6% or adjusted index of 3.8%. In November, we were talking to the, uh, with the board and the public about, you know, what can, this, uh, what can we afford, uh, our taxpayers afford, and what do we need as a school district. And rightfully so, the Board of School Directors decided to take the accelerated opt-out and pass a resolution in December um, to not exceed the adjusted index of 3.8%. I know we've received uh, some questions over the last couple of months from members in the public about what have we worked our way from. So I just want to pause on this again. The highest taxable opportunity the school district had was to go to the adjusted index of 3.8%. The Board of School Directors passed an accelerated opt-out not to exceed 3.8% in December, not to tax the local taxpayers at the highest possible rate that they could. I know we've received these questions periodically at meetings saying it's clear that you're taxing people as high as you can. We are not. In fact, we're going to the base index, and we'll get to that in a moment. So in December, the board, rightfully so, passed a resolution not to exceed the adjusted index of 3.8%. In May, we came back and discussed, and also around that same period of time, December, we talked with the public about a possible tax increase of 3.5%. So we agreed not to go to 3.8%. We came back and looked at a 3.5% tax increase, which will be on a slide later on. And then we obviously had an opportunity to readjust our budget. Um, the pandemic hit, and we're now in front of you in, at this point in time in June talking about bringing our tax increase down to the index. In May, the board approved the 2021 proposed final budget, and in that tax increase, we looked at a 2.6%. So we moved our way from a 3.8% to a 3.5% to now we're looking at a 2.6%. We also wanted to remind the public again of the timeline. Uh, the June 3rd is the notice of the intent to adopt a final budget. Uh, we'll have a conversation at that period of time as well. On June 16th, the board will adopt the final budget. Um, if there's any issues or concerns from this evening all the, all the way up until obviously June 16th, the board has to be aware and the public has to be aware that school districts, and there has been no waiver or change uh, at this point in time, must adopt and approve a balanced final budget by June 30th, 2020. The reason why we are looking to do ours by June 16th is so that we can get our tax uh, offices ready to go to put out a tax bill to make sure that we are able to collect that money to, to balance, uh, to, to provide our programs. Again, what were we considering prior to the mandated closures? This came up from a member of the public uh, in a couple different meetings and, and we'll keep an answering this question. Budget considerations pre-mandated closure. We were looking to convert existing lead teachers, eight of them in our elementary schools, into uh, assistant principals. There are many, many unfunded state mandates, teacher evaluation, state testing, data collection that require a, someone with a certification and administration to be able to, pro to provide those resources for us. And right now we're asking someone under a teacher certification to do that work and we were going to look to convert to assistant principals. Um, we were also going to add six reading specialists to the elementary level, again, trying to get back to those much needed resources that we lost eight or nine years ago. We were looking to add and build uh, guidance counselor positions into the elementary school. This past year, through our use of title funds, uh, last year we were able to put guidance counselors into some of our elementary schools we never had them before, thanks to the leadership of this board. We were, again, looking to build and add five more uh, guidance counselors to our elementary schools. We were looking to add one network technician and some support to media services um, in the, uh, the budgeting process prior to the mandated closures. That was a little bit under $2 million in estimated costs, and at that time, that would have been a tax increase of 3.5% below the 
below the adjusted index of 3.8% prior to COVID-19, we were looking to go out at a 3.5% tax increase. So next up, we have the slide that we've, we continue to revisit just to show the historic view of the district's tax increase versus the base index and the adjusted index. So as we reviewed at the previous committee meeting, uh, you can see in yellow what the actual increase was. Right below that, the base index and the adjusted index. And as Dr. McGarry pointed out, this year's base index is 2.6% with an adjusted index of 38 So here's a slide where we'd like to go through the actual impact of the right now approved proposed final budget at 2.6. So through community uh, outreach and questioning, we they were it was asked of us to add another column to the right hand side, and we've added the $350,000 assessment mark, which is the only difference to this slide in comparison to the previous presentation, and that shows a 2.6 and a $350,000 tax assessment. It's an annual impact of $344 for the year. And again, I'll reiterate that these assessments are based on the current assessments. It is not the countywide reassessment that everyone just received in the mail. In addition to adding the $350,000 assessment, we had a few comments come in in regards to our projected uh, bond issuance to cover capital improvements, which would be uh, Aronimic and any other projects that we have planned, that maximum resolution of uh, $38 million. As we presented, the millage study requirement shows previously that it would take 0.69% going into next year's budget. So this slide just shows you the of the 2.6% tax increase, 0.69 is built in, and that is a direct impact to the taxpayer within the 2.6. So it's part of it. And you'll see that we've presented, and it was showing $19. This is all rounded, so you'll see it's $75,000 assessment, a $20 impact. If you were to go up to $150,000 assessment, it's $39 a year. Or $350,000 all the way to the right would be $91 for the year. And again, same as the previous slide, these are current assessments, not the reassessment uh, that's upcoming in the following year. So, as we talked um, last, last month, uh, we talked about the assumptions. So if we are to continue to move forward based on these following assumptions, that we are opening schools on time in August, um, not in a virtual setting, that we're able to get back to teaching and learning as we once knew it, um, this would take into consideration a 2.6% tax increase, which is the base index. Again, the school board is going to the base index, if they authorize this, not to the highest taxable opportunity they could. Under a 2.6% tax increase, um, not only do we get the 0.69% toward the, the bond issuance of uh, improving our facilities and renovating and expanding Aronimic Elementary School, it allows us to maintain staffing, the 2019-20 staffing, so there will be no new staffing added so the slide previous to adding, turning um, lead teachers into assistant principals, um, the guidance counselor positions being added, as well as the um, positions related to guidance, a 2.6% does not allow us to add those, uh, st that staff, but a 2.6% does allow us to maintain current staffing, the 1920 staffing that we have right now going into next school year. It also is based on the fact that the state will level fund its uh, current funding of, of public education as well as federal funding will be level based on the 1920 funding that we, that we saw this past school year. Prior to COVID-19, we were anticipating an increase of $1.2 million in basic education funding. I think we'd be pretty rest assured that we will not be seeing that 1.2 increase. Prior to COVID-19, we thought that we might see a $270,000 increase into our special education funding at a state level. We are now not anticipating receiving that at those dollars. Um, and state funding could decrease, no less than the three-year average. And we were trying to look into this information as we built this budget. In order to get staffing where we need it, we, we, we went back and looked at a 2.6% tax increase. Again, it includes the 2020 bond issuance, issuance for capital projects and the Aronimic project. It does not include CARES Act funding because um, we're still working our way through the state guidance. At this point in time, 
we have been told, we have received some information that we should share or use the, um, the CARES funding with non-public schools, similar to how we allocate our Title I funding, our share of Title I funding to non-public schools. There is some still some de debate on how that's being interpreted and how that money can be shared. And the recommendation um, at a state level is to not actually budget it in your budget, uh, to consider that uh, as a one-time revenue uh, for things such as PPE, technology, or other resources to help you get through this period of time. Budget un unknowns and impacts still that are still out there as, as uh, just before this public meeting took place. Um, there's consideration still on a state level of a 0% tax increase. There's the delivery of instruction, virtual on, or, or online only versus flexible instruction as we talked about in the presentation with Marvin Lee where we discussed the idea that even if we go green, we'll still have to have a plan to provide virtual or blended learning, some days in, some days online instruction, especially if the rumors are true that there could be another uptick uh, of COVID-19 in the, in the winter. We should be prepared to handle that and there's a cost associated with planning for that. Nonetheless, if there is a 0% tax increase, if it's a forced 0% tax increase, here's what we would have to do to balance our budget. We would have to consider program curtailment, which is a process, uh, a chapter four process, where the administration would have to look at cutting specific programs, academic programs, looking at how we can meet those same standards with existing staff in order to balance our budget. So we'd have to make program curtailment considerations. We'd have to also uh, reduce the capital projects. Um, we'd have to make a consideration to forgo some of the projects that we have in the school district. Um, one of them obviously would be, as you see on this list, delaying the Euronymic project with a 0% tax increase. We'd institute, have to institute a hiring freeze as well as um, through attrition and retirement, the consideration of not rehiring staff, in particular not rehiring staff at the high school because there is some wiggle room as it relates to credits in Chapter 4 requirements. It would require us to really relook at how we provide our instruction, in particular to high school students, and how much staff we would need if we were to readjust our programs and readjust our credit requirements. Currently, the class of 2023, our current freshman class, has the opportunity to graduate with 21 credits. It is not mandatory that they leave with 21 credits. A 0% tax increase would force us to look at adjusting how many credits we allow high school students to take in order to graduate. We'd have to reduce our hourly employees. We'd have to reduce our capital reserve trans transfer, which we're trying to build up to, to uh, have a stable capital reserve for unexpected things such as a leaking roof or a boiler that would break or any unforeseen issues that our buildings have uh, that are old we'd have to reduce our transfer of money into our capital reserve. We also potentially would see a reduced bond rating based on the use of fund balance because the board and the public may ask the district to use more fund balance, more of our savings to cover the cost in a 0% tax increase instead of delaying some of these projects. And that's a one-time use of that money. You very rarely get that money back. And then a reminder that we all have to do all of this prior to June 30th. There are still unknowns as far as the state budget is concerned. There's talks of their budget at the state level being passed in multiple phases, and that we may have to go back in even as after June and reopen our budget if the state allows that to happen to make some changes. Of the list of items that you see here, once we pass our final budget, if there are changes at a state or federal level, we would have to go into bullet point number one. The last opportunity for us to balance our budget, budget once we have passed and we've already put out for our tax collection would be to change our programs in the school district. And I know that that would be one of the last things we want to do. We have been having those conversations with our staff and our faculty, and we'd like to hold off on cutting programs as much as possible here in the school district. So next what we did was we actually put together a visual to show where we are and if there were any mandated 0% uh, tax increases, how's that impact this budget. So moving left to right, the second column is the actual approved proposed final budget at a 2.6% tax increase. This amount is the exact same uh, layout as our previous presentation showing the $208 million in revenue, $215.4 million in expenditures, 
having our expenditures exceed our revenue of 7.3 million. And if you were to factor in that 2.6% tax increase, that's an additional revenue of 1.97, leaving you having to commit $5.375 million of fund balance. If there was a 0% tax increase and we had no change to the expenditures, and you take that 1.9 out, you now have to commit $7.35 million of fund balance to balance your budget. The final column on the right-hand side is a mandated 0% tax increase with a reduction to expenditures to balance the budget the same as the approved proposed final budget. So the difference here is obviously reducing your expenditures by $1.977 million. So in order to do so, this next slide will break down the actual impacts of some of the previous slide that Dr. McGarry spoke about. So first, I'll just discuss it the revenue impact of a 0% tax increase. It, many look at a 0% mandated tax increase as level funding. In Upper Darby, due to assessment loss from the current year to next year of almost thir over $13 million of assessment loss, that actually equates to a loss of revenue of 530, roughly $530,000 of revenue. So a 0% mandated tax increase would be a loss of revenue for Upper Darby School District, not level funded. So that's one of the main impacts that is somewhat buried into these numbers that we're talking about. And if you remember from the previous presentation, when you look at the 1920 budget versus the 2021 budget, a 1.9% increase almost gave you the exact same dollar amount increase as a 2.6. And that's due to that lost assessment. So we wanted to make that clear uh, going through this presentation. And just as Dr. McGarry spoke previously about, the reduction in expenditures to quote unquote bounce the budget or bring it back to that use of fund bounce of the five million, five point three, you could go we were we're looking at reduction in attrition, which comes out to around five hundred thousand dollars, potential program curtailment, which is really a plug, meaning that's we would have to have a range to pull back. Uh, the others would be capital project delays. So if you were to delay one project versus multiple, you're talking about a bond issuance of a lower amount. So that could be anywhere from a reduction in expenditures in the 2020-2021 budget of 280000 all the way up to a half a million. Uh, the reason why we would still be issuing a bond, we have gone out and we've started projects, uh, paving projects. We At the previous board meeting, we approved uh, two window projects, one at Beverly Hills and one at uh, Garford Elementary, and there are a few others going through the pipeline now. Uh, so that's why it wouldn't completely eliminate the bond payment because we would still be issuing a bond that would just, you know, again, we issued a resolution that we wouldn't go above $38 million, which obviously means we can come in under that. Uh, so those are the dollar amounts that are associated with that. The other piece is future consideration for contracted services, and we have here to be determined. Now, Board Member Leah Dahl has actually brought up at a good time the idea of potentially outsourcing a service such as transportation. There are many districts in the area and in the state that choose to outsource transportation. I think many of them look at it from the perspective of a school district is in the business of educating children. They're not technically supposed to be in the business of transporting children. So what do we do best? We educate the children. Uh, you know, outsourcing services such as transportation, you, you would imagine a company who only transports children would be able to maybe offer a better service. They'd have uh, you know, bigger economies of scale, and be able to, uh, you know, update and maintain a fleet from a business perspective versus, you know, the district really looking at, you know, pro providing the best transportation service we can with the funds that we have. Uh, and that's just one example. Uh, so, and then again, when you consider all these things, there's obviously a negative impact on student achievement. And that's going to be insurmountable. To be able to catch up on that, those kind of expenditures to get them back into the budget and to be able to afford that becomes more and more challenging every year you have something like this happen and I think you know you, anybody who watches these meetings or is uh, you know a part of this board or community or staff knows that we always talk about when the stimulus funds went away years ago and the loss of reading specialists and that impact to our test scores and the student achievement um, so this is almost something that in my mind you know aligns very closely with that that type of impact and that we're still you know trying to make leaps and bounds to catch up from that loss. The piece I'd like to add to this as far as the redu reduction of expenditures and balance in the budget, we don't want to repeat history. 
So the reduction through attrition would be one where we don't want to see anybody lose their jobs that are teachers or uh, folks that work here in the school district because we're trying to recover from years ago. Unlike other school districts who are now feeling this maybe for the first time, Upper Darby's been here and we're trying to rebuild um, the trust and the relationships not only with our staff but with this community. Bullet point number two is a, is a fancy way of, of really saying getting rid of programs, cutting programs. It's the state's, one of the allow, allowable exceptions for the state. One of them originally was furloughing staff. The other one is pro, program curtailment, which is the school district would have to come together through curriculum and instruction, look at the state standards, and say, okay, what programs can we cut that we can cover in other ways with teacher certification, make those changes, and to balance the budget. As Craig has up here in the presentation, we'd be having to, we have to find a way to get to a 0% tax increase that through attrition and reduction of staffing, and that $500,000 is a rough estimate of not bringing back six high school teachers, which the impacts has an impact on class size at the high school and potentially has an impact on class offerings at the high school. That's really the pain and suffering we're looking at at the high school if this were to happen. That wouldn't get us there. We'd have to come back and then look at things such as the coaches, the instructional coaches that we might have in the school district, other programs that we have in the school district, the guidance counselors, or academic programs that may exist through program curtailment, if that had to happen. What we learned from the past is this would be a conversation with the board and the public. It wouldn't be a message that we would just deliver this and say, here's where it is. We've already been, get, we've already been having conversations with our teachers union um, at each level as well as really spending a lot of time with all the departments at the high school uh, to make sure that we understand what we're up against here as a school district. A 2.6% tax increase preserves this, allows us to get to where we need to get as a school district and community, improving our facilities, balancing what we have, and moving this school district forward in, in a competitive way. And I think that's why the administration is looking for that 2.6% tax increase moving forward would be to allow these programs and these facilities improvements to have happen. We do not want to go backward. We're trying to build and move this school community forward. And the final slide here is just to go through, again, we're going to revisit the Act 1 timeline that was presented before. Uh, next steps are a public notice of the intent to adopt the final budget, which would occur on June 16th. That is a scheduled committee meeting, and we'll have a special voting meeting following the committee meeting. Uh, that will also include in the committee meeting another presentation of the budget. And then again, special meeting, having the final uh, adoption. And again, we just want to reiterate, we cannot approve a budget any later than June 30th, and that is state mandated. So at this time, are there any questions from the board? Um, Craig, thanks again for this great presentation. I know this is the second time we've, you know, seen this publicly to this detail, and I want to thank you for putting in those additional details on um, the higher, you know, the, the higher tax um, assessments. What I did want to just stress is um, I was elected to the board in 2006. No, 2000, sorry, 2013. Um, and when I got on the board, I, I had a, a different um, perspective um, on the taxes. And then I went to Harrisburg as a board director, not as a community member. Before that, I had just gone as a community member. And when I got in to speak with a lot of the legislators, ones that are in the upper um, tiers of, of making decisions, um, the leaders of the House and Senate, one of the questions as a, that he kept these um, – legislators kept posing to me is, well, did you go to your adjusted Act 1 index? And, you know, I said, no, actually, we, we tried to keep our tax, you know, around the base um, Act 1 index because our community already pays the majority of the school um, funding needs for our district. And we, they, they simply can't afford it anymore. And we, we continue to advocate and we continue to advocate about this 16 to 17 to $18 million that we are underfunded from the state. And we do need the community to join us in asking for that. Um, we are trying our best to keep the taxes as close to the base index as possible. If you look at this slide, I don't know, it's slide number five. It's perhaps if you could put it up on the screen. Um, we, we have been trying to keep it at or just above or just below the base index 
um, the state does allow and has basically said, but you in Upper Darby, you can tax to this highest amount, basically because they're not willing to raise the taxes. So, um, you know, unfortunately, this does get put down to local school districts, but we have a constitutional mandate to provide a thorough and efficient system of public education. So I do want to thank you for um, all of the creative ideas, the things that we've done to try to minimize it as much as possible. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rogers, thank you very much. Dr. McGarry, thank you very much for your comments and your explanation. Next, next item. The next item is the policies, and this will require board action. So I'm actually going to hand this over to Mr. Desnoyers uh, to lead the discussion on the four policies that are up tonight. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. There are um, four policies that have gone through a first reading at the May board meeting two weeks ago and will be up for um, a second reading at the June board meeting, which will occur um, next Tuesday, June 2nd. And so the, the four policies um, being changed are policy 335, family and medical leaves, policy 626, federal fiscal compliance, uh, policy 810.1, drug and alcohol testing for covered drivers, and policy 904, public attendance at school events. So I will uh, read a summary of the uh, changes to each of the policies. So for policy 335, family and medical leaves, uh, there are actually no changes to the policy 335 itself. However, the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or FFCRA, contains specific provisions for the expansion of family and medical leave and paid sick leave effective April 2nd, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. These temporary changes are explained in the new Families First Coronavirus Response Act attachment and a new employee rights poster uh, that is both in English and there's one in English and one in Spanish that will be posted to district buildings and made available to uh, district employees. Um, any school district employee considering taking a leave of absence is urged to review policy 335 and uh, the appropriate attachments carefully. Any questions may be addressed to human resources. Next is policy 626, federal fiscal compliance. Policy 626 is being revised to include language regarding payment of staff with federal funds in extenuating or emergency situations in accordance with applicable law, regulations, or emergency declarations by state or federal authorities. Next up is policy 810.1, drug and alcohol testing for covered drivers. Um, federal, I'm sorry, federal regulations being implemented require substantial updates to policy 810.1 and a new attachment, 810.1 AR0, that spells out drug and alcohol testing requirements and procedures for covered drivers. Uh, a covered driver is any district employee who drives, operates, or is in actual physical control or movement of a school bus, school vehicle, or commercial vehicle owned, leased, or operated by the school district. Basically, a covered driver is in a um, is is a is a position in the district that requires a commercial driver's license to carry out. The specific regulations being implemented involve a, what's called a final rule issued by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration establishing the Commercial Driver's License Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. This national clearinghouse will contain commercial driver's license records. The district, as an employer of holders of commercial driver's licenses, will be required to perform a pre-employment search of this clearinghouse 
and an annual search of this clearinghouse for infractions for every covered driver. The nature and type of required testing is spelled out both in federal regulations and in policy 810.1 and uh, 810.1 AR0. Finally, policy 904, public attendance at school events. The updates to this policy are changes related to tobacco and vaping products. Similar changes have recently been made to policy 222 and 323. These changes are required to comply with changes to Pennsylvania law. That concludes my presentation of uh, changes to policies under consideration. Thank you, Mr. Desnoyers, for that uh, comprehensive explanation of those policy changes. Uh, are there any comments or questions from the board? No, Mrs. Buford, nothing, okay. Okay, all right, so public comment. At this time, there are no public comments. Okay. With that being said, Mr. Rogers, can you please review the agenda items presented this evening? Again, we have five agenda items tonight. The first was the COVID-19 preparedness update, which was informational. Uh, Marvin Lee gave an update on our preliminary uh, review of CDC guidelines and gave us a baseline for our future decisions. Agenda item number two is the online ta uh, school tax payment options, which we would request board action. Uh, the district administration reviewed our options as far as accepting online payments moving forward into the future, and we re require board action tonight. Okay, so for the online uh, school tax payment for board, uh, agenda item number two, is the board okay with moving that one forward? Please signify by saying yes. I hear yeses. Yes. yes. Okay, any no's? Any abstains? Okay, so we're moving that one forward. Next agenda item. Next is the administration building relocation. Mr. Craig Harnacek gave a review of the plans before us to be able to renovate the existing transportation and maintenance building. Uh, and what it would take to be able to develop the site and the two options that were for before the board, uh, the administration's recommendations to move forward with the plan uh, without sanitation. Uh, and we were looking for board action and board action would be to move this forward to the next phase of design and be able to move forward towards the bidding of the actual project. Okay, would the board like to move this item forward? Please signify by saying. Uh, absolutely. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes is sufficient. All right. Um, anyone not? Anyone? Any no's? Any abstains? So I think that's unanimous. Next agenda item, Mr. Rogers. Next up was the 2020 2021 budget update, which was informational. Dr. McGarry and myself provided an update on all the information that we have to this point and also elaborated on the impact of a 0% mandated tax increase. Number five, policies, board action. There were four policies presented by Mr. Desnoyers, 335, family medical leaves, 626, federal fiscal compliance, 810.1, drug and alcohol testing for covered drivers, and 904, public attendance at school events. Okay, if the board is okay with moving these policies forward, please signify by saying yes or say yes with the exception of whatever policy you would not like to move forward, please. Yes. 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 So I think that's we're okay with moving those forward. There are no any no's, any collective no's, any abstains. Okay. I think we're moving that forward. A motion is in order for adjournment of the Finance and Operations Committee meeting. David Neal, second. Okay, meeting adjourned. <laughs>